Uh, generation time, there's a big difference in the amount of time it would take the population that's overexploited to recover. Then on this level, we have uh, indication of value. So if we look up at the top here, we have the southern bluefin tuna. This, of all the species of tunas and billfishes, is the most endangered, clearly critically endangered. In a relatively short time, this species was fished down to about 5% of its original spawning stock biomass. Now, the species, the southern bluefin, is widespread below 40 degrees south around the world. However, it has a restricted spawning area between Australia and Indonesia, and that area was targeted by fishing. Uh, a lot of the fishing was not accurately reported. The data was bad, and countries have kept fishing it, and so this one is in really bad shape. We go down a little further. Over here is the Atlantic bluefin tuna, uh, which has two <coughs> populations, two spawning, two discreetly different populations based on spawning. One in the western Atlantic that spawns only in the Gulf of Mexico, and one in the eastern Atlantic that spawns at several places in the Mediterranean. However, these tuna migrate back and forth. Uh, they return to where they were spawned to reproduce, but uh, much of the fishery off the coast of the United States is actually of fishes that were spawned in the Mediterranean, making management very difficult because there's an arbitrary line drawn down the middle of the Atlantic saying these are eastern, these are western Atlantic, these are eastern Atlantic, but we've got fishes that are migrating from one side to the other, uh, really complicating things. Uh, in the western Atlantic, the spawning stock biomass was reduced to probably about 20% of its original level. Now, here's the Pacific bluefin, which we have green here, and I was sure it wasn't green, but again, we didn't have the data when we did these assessments to indicate that there was a severe threat. However, in a previous workshop here in the Pew-sponsored uh, tuna trap uh, workshop, uh, one of our Japanese colleagues had good data showing that the Pacific bluefin is in much worse shape. The catch is going down, uh, fishing is occurring on spawning aggregations, uh, the fishing catch is largely now small tunas, zero and one in age, less than 10 kilos in weight, and when you start fishing all the babies, you're not going to have any that grow up. So I'm sure that if we do a reanalysis, this one will no longer be green. Here's the big eye tuna. The big eye tuna is a problem because after we've eaten all the bluefin tunas for sashimi, the next species that has the nearest character to it in fat content and things is the big eye tuna. Uh, Fishing for part of the big eye tuna is uh, just for catching tuna, but the real problem is fishing around fads. Fads are floating aggregation devices, and in the attempt to catch large numbers of skipjack, the smallest of the tunas and the one that's in the best condition, uh, they catch juvenile big eye, which they don't want. So juvenile big eye are actually a bycatch of the skipjack tuna fishery. And management is trying to deal with this by restricting uh, use of fads. Uh, some of the other species that are down here um, are OK as species. And remember, the red list criteria are looking at global species extinction. And what we have with many tunas is different populations in the different oceans. So some populations of albacore and some populations of yellowfin are, are not in good shape. So uh, we, we have to worry about them. Then finally, data deficient was mentioned before. And there's a data deficient one, one of these gray ones down here. 
is the so-called long-tailed tuna, Thunus tongo. This is a strange tuna in that it frequents more coastal waters. It's not a blue water species. And when I went to India for a, uh, an FAO workshop years ago, I saw there were supposed to be big catches of yellowfin. I went to the market, there weren't any yellowfin. They were all long-tailed, Thunus tongo. So there's a species that's confounded with yellowfin. We have no species assessment for it. We have no data for it. Uh, and we don't know what its structure is. So we need to reevaluate that species uh, to see uh, what level of threat there is. Now, we have a tool, uh, the International uh, Sustainable Seafood Foundation has annually issued a very complex uh, report on each population of each of the major species of tunas so that we have a, an attempt to get new data for reevaluation. Now, the red list, you know, we've been concentrating here on getting species on the red list, but we have to also remember that some of these species need to be updated, as uh, was talked about in the Eastern Pacific. And we need to evaluate long-tailed tuna. We have to reevaluate uh, the Pacific Bluefin tuna. Thank you. Thanks, Bruce. I think for the interest of time, it's uh, good that we move on to the next presenter, Yvonne. Uh, thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'm Bruce, I just a few days ago was in Seafood Summit. There was a company called ABBA, which I think is Swedish, and they're working in Thailand to collect information on the Tongo because that's their main source. <coughs> so I'll make the link. Uh, and in fact, the reason that they started really looking at um, information on this species was that they first of all went to the Red List and they found the yeah, IUCN um, database and found very little information and that actually prompted them. So because they're, they're looking at listing for certification. So that's quite interesting. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how Red listing of uh, a red list assessments are used to advance marine conservation. I'm a co-chair of the Marine Conservation Subcommittee. Claudio is my other half, my better half, and unfortunately he can't be here, but he does send everyone his greetings from across the other side of the world. I've been watching everyone do this. All right. So in terms of marine assessments on the red list. The 1996 was the very first marine red list assessment. It was conducted by Georgina Mace in London. I was lucky enough to be present. It was a fascinating process. A lot of us who were present had really not done this kind of red listing before for marine species and uh, over a hundred species were tackled. Quite a lot of them were found to be at one of the levels of threat and it was quite a controversial listing at the time. And at that time there was very much the myth, the myth that you talked about at the beginning, that many people um, amongst the general public certainly did not believe it would be possible to, to threaten marine species. And amongst the fishery community in general, there was a, a very big divide between people who are working directly in fishery science and those who are working on conservation. And a lot of very good workers themselves were really very much unsure about uh, whether or not species could go extinct. And I, myself, actually, in the early 90s, wrote a paper about the Nassau grouper, which is now endangered, which uh, was, I, I termed the paper endangered or just unlucky. Because at that time, really just generally, I think that reflected what also within the scientific community, we really weren't sure about what was happening with threatened species. In 2003, to address some of these um, uh, issues, the Shatter the Myth project was, was launched um, in IUCN in 2005 to give a greater emphasis to marine issues and to sort of begin to consolidate a little bit um, marine interests within SSC, the Marine Conservation Subcommittee was formed, so I'm just talking about SSC now, and really the Marine Conservation Subcommittee is, a, <coughs> is more of a conduit, it's not that it does a lot, but the idea is to bring under one umbrella a lot of the marine interests. So essentially, that subcommittee, 
the work of the subcommittees through the specialist groups and the various partners. And we work very closely with the GMSA, which was started around the same time. So that's sort of a little bit of background into green within the SSC. So within this context, we prioritized, we went through a prioritization process for the subcommittee. And the one I want to talk about today is about converting red list assessments on these marine species into conservation outcomes. So it reflects a, a couple of things. One is the work of the specialist groups, how the specialist groups not only input into the red list assessments, but then take those assessments and do things with them. And then I'll also talk about how the wider public takes these assessments and sort of the, the many, many directions that these go. But Time and again, my experience has been over a very long t uh, time period that there is a great deal of respect for these red list assessments. They have a high degree of credibility, and that has been extremely important in getting um, a change in general perspective accepted about uh, the, the status of marine species. We haven't got it totally right yet, but this has been very, very important uh, in my opinion, in my experiences. So I'm going to be looking at three areas that we focus on within the marine, uh, uh, the MCSC. And those three areas are um, identifying uh, strategic points for action, um, identifying necessary policy and instruments, and that's why I asked the question about legislation. If we don't have appropriate legislation to protect species that we find to be threatened, then you know what's the next step? So the legislation side is extremely important. And of course, as people have mentioned variously, that there are big gaps in our knowledge. But it's important to identify the gaps, that we know where to put our energy to prioritize money, time, etc. So strategic points for action. One of the most important things has been to identify some of the major threatening factors. What are the major threats that we have to, that we have to um, address? And by looking at whole groups, whole taxonomic groups, it becomes, um, it gives us a very good idea of what these threatening factors are. And once we identify those, that provides us possibility to move forward on key areas for a change, strategic pressure points. So one of the things that's become very apparent is that for the majority of marine species that have been uh, assessed uh, one of the threatening categories, it's overfishing, which is the major threatening factor. And this differs quite considerably from major threatening factor in freshwaters and on land, which are more to do with habitat degradation. And this is important. This is a, a major shift in our ability to understand what's happening in the marine environment and to recognize that addressing overfishing and engaging with a, 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 a very complex set of issues is, is, is part of... Um, is the, is the path we have to go down if we're going to address some of these threats to marine species. So this was a major, this was a major sort of, uh, and it was major because many of the conservation community, because of the long history of association with habitat degradation, the focus of conservation historically had been much more to do with protecting areas, much less to do with actual use of species. So that it's, it was a very important shift that we had to make to recognize this. this thing. Now, I want to use a few of the taxonomic groups to illustrate some of the, some of the points about uh, making change. Um, and one of the, in fact, I think the earliest one that was completely, I don't remember right in the room, right, the earliest group that was completely assessed was the sharks and rays, is that right? Pretty much. And a number of things have come out of these assessments. So there are many hundreds of species of sharks and rays. There is a very engaged, dynamic, and expert group who have over the years uh, managed to pull together information to assess all of these all of these organisms. And apart from the assessments themselves, that expertise has been incredibly important. Many of those people are now engaged in um, various kind of international <coughs> fora. They're, they're, they're writers, they're scientists. A lot of the stuff they do has come out of what they have learned by going through this red listing process. And even the process of red listing forces you to pull together all of this information. And, it almost becomes a mirror. You're faced with, uh, you're faced with what is actually happening. You're forced to do it through the red listing process, and I think that's an important. I think that's a, an important process in itself. Now, one particular example of a major threat within, uh, for many species within this group, within the sharks and the rays, and obviously particularly with the sharks. Although a lot of 
rays have their have parts of themselves used as shark fin. So a major factor was uh, uh, the interest and high value associated with shark fins. It was not the only pressure, but it was an important one um, that increased uh, uh, interest in this particular group. These fins are very high value, so they're part of a very important trade. And what I want to do is just show you where these REDIS assessments have ultimately led us in this particular example. So REDIS assessments in many ways are a starting process, which then radiate out into a whole range of actions. And, and I've seen many parts of this process. And I actually think it's very exciting. And what's happened with shark fin is just one example, but it's exciting because as people have got to know more about the issues, as the documentation has improved, as we can feel much more comfortable now with what we're saying, um, we've seen many places, particularly in North America, initially were banning shark fin or shark fin sales. So this is uh, these are business uh, businesses which are beginning to engage. Um, this is built on uh, uh, public understanding, even public pressure of the issues. So you go from the science to the public understanding to the public pressure. Then, for me, very exciting in Hong Kong, shark fin went off the menu at the Peninsula and Shangri La hotels. This, this is a major thing where you're getting businesses. These are high-profile businesses.